and welcome to our public hearing to review the climate action plan that this administration is establishing for the city of Columbus. I am Council Member Emmanuel Remy, Chair of the Environment Committee. I want to remind everyone that this hearing is currently live on YouTube and Facebook and is also live and being recorded for rebroadcast on CTV, Columbus's government television channel free. The rebroadcast schedule is available at www.columbus.gov. I also want to recognize and thank my uh, council colleagues who are joining us either by watching the broadcast or I see council member Rob Dorans here. So thank you for joining this afternoon. I also want to thank and welcome, wel welcome our presenters. Today we have Aaron Beck, the Sustainable Columbus Liaison Special Projects Manager from the Mayor's Office. Elena Shockey, Assistant Director, Office of Sustainability. Jenna Tapaldi, Climate Advisor, the Office of Sustainability. Say that three times really quick. Today, we're excited to learn more about the Climate Action Plan that is framing the important work our city must do to curb climate, cha climate change impacts during this hearing. We will hear a presentation from the Sustainable Columbus over the over the climate action plan, how we got here, why it is, why it is important, and next steps. We'll hear testimony from such subject matter experts, community advocates, and city partners, all interested in the health of our environment. We'll also learn how our residents can be more involved in the process that will continue for years to come. The climate action plan is a living, breathing document that will have edits and additions in the coming months, but also in the years to come. That being said, it is critically important to have our action plan grounded in science and reality, what is needed to protect our environment and residents and what is physically and financially possible to accomplish year over year. The purpose of this hearing is to engage the residents of Columbus, my council colleagues and the sustainable Columbus team to gain valuable feedback. Without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Aaron Beck, Elena Shockey, and Jenna Tapaldi to begin their transportation, their presentation, excuse me. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, council member. And I am going to share my screen really quick here. Maybe. Okay. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Council Member Remy, for hosting today's hearing and this conversation about our city's draft climate action plan. Um, really appreciate your leadership to create this space for us to um, further continue the dialogue with our residents and with stakeholders and continue to get feedback on this critical plan for our community. Um, again, my name is Erin Beck. I am part of the policy team in Mayor Ginther's office, and I am our Sustainable Columbus liaison, so I'm kind of going to kick us off here, but I'm um, very excited to be here today with members of our sustainability team, and I get the honor and privilege of working with them every day and learning from them every day and excited to have them share more about the plan as well. Um, so at State of the City last year, Mayor Ginther committed the Columbus community to be carbon neutral by 2050, really to ensure that our city is doing its part to combat global climate change and limit global temperature rise. While we know this problem is global in scale, it's also extremely local in its impact. We know our most vulnerable residents are on the front lines of climate every single day. You know, with more 90 plus degree days and extreme temperature swings, um, that means increased adverse health impacts, more stress and repair for infrastructure, um, both public and in homes. So when we think about our roads and sidewalks and water pipes, um, and it means higher energy costs for heating and cooling. So all of these reasons and more are why addressing climate is so critical for our community. And since making the commitment and goal, our sustainability team has been working on developing a climate action plan that will act as a roadmap and guide for meeting this necessary 2050 goal. Um, the plan aims to show how our community will adapt and improve resilience to climate hazards, um, understanding that need to be nimble over time, just like Council Member Remy was saying, it will be kind of a living document. 
Um, it will outline the social, environmental, and economic benefits expected from the plan and really will center the need for equity throughout the implementation process, as well as during the planning process as well, I should add. Um, and of course, it will identify and lay out the partners needed to deliver on that 2050 goal. So since this is a community-wide plan, it is going to take action from more than the city alone in order for us to be successful. And so again, just wanted to revisit some of the why for this work and expected benefits of acting on climate. First and foremost, it really is all about ensuring climate justice, which goes back to that equity piece and really making sure that all of our residents, especially those in our opportunity neighborhoods, um, the black community and other communities of color, new Americans, that they really are an integral part of this work and that they're really benefiting and seeing the impacts of this work as, as, as we um, really move toward implementation. Public health or human health, this is really a huge reason why this work matters. It will help reduce pollutants and hazards, improve our air quality and overall quality of life um, through that foundation of better health. Uh, environmental quality, so this is something that I think goes really hand in hand with that health and quality of life aspect. It really will help us preserve our resources and ecosystems, ensuring that where we live, work and play is a thriving environment. And then last but certainly not least, something that I think sometimes get overlooked by folks or they don't necessarily think about this aspect is the economic prosperity and workforce development opportunity that we have. Um, through this work, we really have a huge opportunity um, to, as President Biden says, to build back better and really create you know, good paying jobs and build a local diverse pipeline into these jobs of the future. So there really are many reasons why this work is so critical and how it's going to benefit our community as we move toward that 2050 goal. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Elena to talk a little bit more about the process and plan thus far. Thank you very much, Erin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elena Schottke. Um, I um, work in our Office of Sustainability, and as Erin mentioned, I wanted to take a moment to take you back through our process and help to center everyone on where we are today. Since 2013, the city has been tracking our greenhouse gas emissions, both from our government operations and community-wide. And that has helped us to create a solid baseline inventory for our greenhouse gas emissions. So we know where we're starting from. Um, that's critical to being able to know where we need to go. Um, and as many of you know, last February, uh, Mayor Genther announced our bold and ambitious goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. That's really when we took step two and we said we have this important target. Uh, the next step after that was to begin to forecast emissions. So to understand if we continued to do business as usual and didn't change our actions at all from um, 2020 um, to 2050, what would our emissions profile look like? Then we begin to layer in, if we begin to take action um, or take more bold uh, action, how our emissions forecasts will begin to change over time. And that's really what number three of our work was, which is forecasting emissions. <clears throat> that becomes the critical foundation to starting to select strategies. And that's where we are today. We are at step four and we're, one, and we're interested in sharing with you all in the community uh, the strategies that we've begun to select so that you can help us in this kind of iterative stage to determine are these the correct strategies, um, are they at the right level of ambition, um, and um, will they, they serve our cities in the four ways that Erin mentioned in our last slide. After we uh, get to, after we are able to select all of our strategies and put them in our climate action plan, that's when the rubber really hits the road and we have to think about funding and implementation and tracking and monitoring progress. And then it really becomes a cycle for us from there on out where we're looking at how are the actions that we're taking, um, how are they progressing and are they leading the emissions reductions and the adaptation um, plans that we had hoped for. Erin, if you could advance the slide. So as I mentioned, we've been doing inventories for some time and you can see where what our inventories look like. 
we basically have emissions that come from three sectors, uh, from the building sector, from the transportation sector, and the waste sector. Um, and the, our inventories give us a, a good profile of what our emissions are looking like from those different sectors. You can also see up in this graph, in this bar graph, population, um, and that while our overall emissions reductions are um, staying the same, reducing a little bit, um, our population has continued to grow. Um, so that's great. That means that we are really starting to make progress in our battle against climate change, but it also illustrates that we're going to continue to need to do more um, if we are going to have the absolute emission reductions that we are. That, so what is that? What does the path to carbon neutrality look like? This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's a, a critical list to kind of understand where where we are and where we hope to go. In the next nine years, um, we know that we need to take significant action. And so in the building sector, that looks like um, ambitious building energy efficiency policies and renewable energy work. In the transportation sector, it means going aggressively on um, vehicle electrification and reducing our vehicle miles traveled. It also means pursuing water efficiency. These are all things that we have the infrastructure in place or can quickly get the infrastructure in place to have significant, to make significant changes in the nine years that we have in our first uh, portion of our climate action plan. But we also recognize that to be successful long term, we have to plan for the future. And that is in the form of transit planning, zoning code changes, um, exploring resilient building design. These are things that take time to do and require additional planning. Um, and you are seeing that planning happening right now in the form of our Link Us initiative, in the form of the zoning code updates that you're seeing our city pursuing. Um, and so that's all about planning for the future so that we're able to first lock in our 2030 emission reductions, um, but have a plan for how are we gonna continue to pursue substantial emission reductions from 2030 to 2050. So just a peek into the Climate Action Plan. I know many of you have probably already looked through the Climate Action Plan, know it as like the back of your hand. Um, but generally, our Climate Action Plan is broken into five chapters, empowering a community of climate leaders. And this is really all about the fact that to take climate action, there's a requirement that we all um, invest in changed behavior. And to invest in change behavior, we all have to become a community of climate leaders who are working together towards this goal in our daily lives, both at home, at work, um, <clears throat> and at play, I guess. Um, we also have our next chapter, which is about sustainable neighborhoods, which is where you get a lot of the adaptation actions, right? This, this work that Erin mentioned about becoming a resilient city um, and growing prosperous and sustainable neighborhoods. And then, as I mentioned, when we went through the emissions reduction graph, in our, we then break into three chapters that really discuss our major sources of emissions within our city, buildings, transportation, and waste. And within each chapter, you also will find a division into strategies and then individual actions. And this is where you know, we really look forward to hearing from you about these strategies and actions. Um, and, and, and what resonates within our community and, and what resonates um, for our residents. Now I'll turn it over to you, Jenna, to talk a little bit more about how we're trying to seek feedback um, from residents at this time. Thanks, Elena, and thanks, Council Member Remy, for hosting this really important public hearing. Um, hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Jenna Tapaldi. I am the climate advisor for the city of Columbus through the American Cities Climate Challenge. I have the pleasure and privilege of working with Aaron and Elena um, and many others in the city on important climate work and glad to be here. Um, so I'll build a little bit on the points that Aaron made earlier and highlight the fact that we know that um, our black and brown communities and our low income communities are already feeling the impacts of climate change. 
This is in the form of increased utility bills. This is money needed for home repairs due to flooding. Um, it means that residents in these communities often have um, less access to shade and green space in their neighborhoods. And really taking care of our community is the impetus for our climate work. Um, we know that the planet will sustain with or without humanity and with or without us but we want a thriving and healthy and prosperous community for our residents that have lived here for years and residents that are going to live here for generations to come. And so, um, Aaron, if you could advance to the next slide. Uh oh, okay, thanks. Um, this really leads us to taking a critical look at the intersection between the climate change and racial equity. These are two key priorities for Mayor Ginther. Um, we know that we can't advance one without the other, and as we we work on climate and we work to um, mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change, we also need to work to dismantle racial inequity. And so we want to ensure that through our climate action work, that the benefits of that work um, create communities that are safe for all residents. They lead to equitable economic outcomes for all and that we're really delivering the benefits of climate change to our residents and our communities that are hit first and worst by the impacts, which are often our black and brown communities. And by addressing these intersecting crises, we can see the benefits of health, affordability, accessibility, cultural preservation, um, among others that you see here in the middle of the Venn diagram on this screen. And so, uh, next slide. In order to make this work a reality, we have committed to an equitable engagement process for our climate action plan. And really what this means for us is that ensuring that we are hearing from residents that have been historically left out of this conversation. We want to hear from residents across all ages, socioeconomic status, genders, neighborhoods, um, and ensure that their voices are centered and elevated as we consider what climate work looks like in the next decade and the next 30 years here in Columbus. And so, um, we, we are following some best practices that we've learned from other cities, including um, Denver and Seattle, who have led on equitable climate work and are working to create multiple channels for residents to get engaged and multiple channels for us to reach these communities that um, have historically been left out of the conversation. And so um, one way that we have done that is we have posted our entire draft climate action plan on our on the city's climate action website, and we created a considerate website, which is sort of a crowdsourcing site that has all 30 actions listed on the website. Residents can log on to the site and provide input on each of those. There's also a dedicated section for new ideas, so we understand that um, residents could have really creative um, and innovative ideas for ways to improve their communities, and we want to hear from them as well. Um, so we have that, that channel online. Through a grant from the American Cities Climate Challenge, we were able to fund um, impact community action, and they are leading community meetings, really targeting residents in our black and brown communities to elevate their voices and get their feedback on the climate action plan. Um, and to date, impact has held four meetings. We have, they have another one scheduled for the end of this upcoming month. Um, and they've, they've been able to meet one-on-one -on -one through those meetings and one-on-one -on -one with um, over nearly 100 residents. Um, we have created a climate action plan toolkit, which is sort of a presentation and a facilitator's guide that we have posted on our website that anybody can um, log on and download. It is intended to um, highlight the portions of the climate action plan that really affect the everyday life of our residents and are centered around how residents can save energy, water, and money at home, how we can create sustainable transportation options to get folks um, to jobs and to essential services, and then how we can create thriving neighborhoods and businesses. And um, we have worked through a number of key channels to push out the climate action plan toolkit in order to get uptake, um, like I mentioned, any Resident can download that. They can um, go through the toolkit with their neighbors, with their book club, with um, community groups, and really it, it walks you through prompts to collect feedback on these categories. Um, and that is feedback that we collect and are taking as part of the resident engagement process. We also worked with um, a local facilitator to train 15 community leaders through the neighborhood liaisons. Um, on how to use and deploy the toolkit. Um, the intent is for them to take that into their neighborhoods 
to folks that they are they're already talking to that they're they're engaging with on a day to day basis, um, walk them through the toolkit to collect that feedback, um, and that is all feedback that we take and we analyze um, at the end of our engagement period at the end of this month, and so. All of those materials are posted on our website, which we can share out it's on our sustainable Columbus website. Um, the climate action plan toolkit is available for download in English and Spanish. Um, we encourage you to take advantage of those um, and I can speak for myself and I believe my colleagues that if um, folks have questions about how to get involved or how to use those resources, we're happy to chat with you individually. But with that, I'll turn it back to Erin. There we go. Thank you so much, Jenna. Yeah, sorry, I thought my screen was frozen for a second there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that and how important that equitable engagement um, has been throughout this process and will continue to be as we continue working on the draft um, climate action plan. So I think that does kind of segue nicely just into all of the different stakeholders and organizations and people who are going to be critical to success in reaching that 2050 goal. Um, certainly the city has a huge role to play um, in advancing and holding ourselves accountable for this work and for the goal. Um, but as you can see from the column here, you know, all of our departments will be engaged in certain strategic areas of the plan. Um, but you can also see that there are community organizations, many community organizations and stakeholders who will also be critical to reaching carbon neutrality and who will need to really take action to help us get there and to reach that goal. Um, and so John kind of shared out the different ways that folks, residents and individuals can get involved. Um, just a reminder, you know, the draft plan is available for comment and feedback on the Considerate website and we are taking feedback um, through the end of this month. So just like Jenna was sharing, these are um, some specific ways that you can reach out and that you can, that is the website that you can go to there. You're the first bullet point for the considerate website. Um, and then if you are interested in hosting your own meeting or downloading kind of the meeting toolkit that Jenna was talking about, um, that's under that website on the fourth bullet there. And then certainly you can contact us as well if you are looking to get involved. Um, and again, if you go to that, that website there that's listed on the bottom, our contact information is there. Um, and then another way to get involved, I will add, is as an individual resident in the community, certainly if you are a Green Spot member, we encourage you to become one um, so you can learn more about ways that you can live um, greener and save money and help, um, help us reach these goals. And so then just to recap on next steps and timeline, again, the public feedback comment is open through the end of this month. We'll then be reviewing and analyzing that feedback to determine potential changes and adjustments to the plan. Um, additionally, we'll then hold stakeholder workshops again this spring so that we can really, um, you know, give more feedback from, give, share with them the resident feedback that they've received um, and review and discuss it. And then the goal is for this summer for that feedback to be incorporated into the final climate action plan um, and implementation plan. And then, of course, in the long term, we do want to create an ongoing feedback loop with the community on climate implementation because we know that this is going to be, again, somewhat of a living document. So we want to make sure that we're kind of in constant communication with the community um, about how, how this work is, is panning out. So. And so in closing, I'm going to either give credit to either Jenna or Elena for finding this, but just an illustration that really shows the opportunity and moment that we're in right now. So truly when it comes to acting on climate, we have the chance for a new way forward, especially when you kind of couple that with the need for um, COVID health and economic recovery. Um, you know, we really have a, an opportunity to create a new path. Um, so just some food for thought. And thank you all again so much for the time and I will hand things back over to Council Member Remy. Thank you very much to all of you for the work that you put into this. Um, it's, you know, it's ever evolving and especially with the new administration. I was on a call this afternoon with Vicki Arroyo uh, from uh, the EPA and, and many community leaders or mayors and council members from across the country um, sharing, you know, what they're doing. And of course the announcement of the Resilience 21 project under this administration. Um, you know, things are constantly evolving. And so we've, we've got uh, work, you know, that, that 
is being completed, but certainly can and will be adjusted as we move forward. Uh, and as new uh, programs are available, because I think the purpose of Resilience 21 is to really help to assist local municipalities and cities to achieve these goals. Um, you know, looking at, you just outlined some of the ways that um, people should get involved and can get involved. And of course, had a lot of feedback uh, thus far, but, but it's very clear that this thing isn't going to print yet. Um, you know, wanted to talk about, like, for instance, you know, I, I feel like we should have another opportunity for public comment when there is a final version of the plan. And, you know, would that be the goal and entitled of you guys, for you guys? I think, um, can folks hear me okay? Yeah. Thought I was getting a little okay. Thought I was hearing a little feedback there. Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, once you know, we have incorporate that feedback. We definitely intend to come back to the community and share out, you know, what we heard through. I think this resident feedback period, um, and then just really kind of go through, you know, the changes that have been made based on that feedback, um, and kind of explain, you know, the ins and outs of why. Um, I can't really give specific examples at this point because we're just not there in the process yet, but we definitely, like I was saying at the end, want to continue, you know, conversation with the community about the plan. Um, and to your point, we've always kind of, you know, talked about this as being a living document and, and something that is going to be a framework and a roadmap for us to meet that goal. Um, and, you know, we have to be open, I think, as well to changes um, you know, if they need to be made. Yeah, I don't generally have anything to add, but <laughs> I would I would just add, you know, this is our this is the first time we're sharing this with the community, and there is certainly no perfect plan, but there is certainly no perfect first draft, and um, and that's and what you're seeing, I think, is the product of that, right, is that it's really great to get feedback that will improve our plan, and it is certainly our intent to let people know how your feedback is improving our plan. That, that's good. I mean, that's a key point right there that this is the first draft and not the final draft. And so, you know, again, appreciate all the advocacy. We've received, you know, lots of uh, emails uh, throughout the you know last couple of weeks, and um, including, you know, we, we heard from Kat, Kathy Cowan Becker, who is a great advocate uh, on these issues. Um, you know, they cite in that in that particular, um, a lot of the emails talk about the 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, where they cited that you know, 45% reduction in emissions by 2030. Ours is only set at 25. You know, how do you come to that number? Obviously, there's lots of subsets below that that, you know, funnel up in some things that may be relatively low, for instance, um, electric vehicles as a just as a starting point, as more and more manufacturers like GM, Ford, uh, move their platforms over to electric or at least hybrid, um, you know, these things could be accelerated much faster than by 2030. So again, I, I just want you to kind of set people, you know, like how, how you got there initially and I'm assuming that, you know, based on feedback, we might be able to improve these numbers uh, even at the 2030 point. Yeah, so that's a great question, Councilman Marini and Aaron and Jenna, please help me out um, if you have additional points. But um, as I mentioned, when I kind of was going through the where we are in the process, um, Point three was really where you start to forecast your emissions reductions. And what, what, what you're doing, we use a tool that most local governments use that's called ICLE Clear Path. Um, and what they do is they use um, science-based emission reductions and you layer in, you know, um, your actions that you plan to take and that will lead to what the number of tons of greenhouse gas emissions are that will be reduced by those individual actions and that's where you end up with your percentage reduction. Um, 
and the conversation about what actions to include um, by by 2030 is a, is an ongoing one, right? Um, and you know, at what level? Uh, we worked really closely with our. We have an internal interdepartmental climate commitments working group to kind of try to calibrate what's the appropriate level of ambition in transportation and in the building sector. Um, so each department had representation and kind of thinking this through. And that's that was just the starting point. Then last May, we did workshops with stakeholders. And we ask our stakeholders the same questions. We said, are these the right set of actions? Do they have the appropriate level of ambition? Um, and then based on that, that is what led to the draft that folks are seeing here today. Um, between May and um, now March, certainly, you know, as Aaron and you, Council Member Remy, have mentioned, there's a new level of ambition nationally, um, which is really exciting. And it can certainly influence and impact where our level of ambition might um, might end up. Yeah, I mean, you know, just thinking about working with our partners and CODA, you know, established a goal of 30 electric vehicles, you know, how do we push that to 50? And of course, that's, you know, somewhat our role as elected officials is to push on the board uh, and also to work with them to figure out, are there ways to amplify that goal, um, you know, by 2030? And I know it, as Liam uh, Rodriguez is here to speak a little bit later uh, about that. Uh, but, but you know, this is a collaborative effort. It's not just uh, the city of Columbus. It really takes our partners commitment and all of uh, us to kind of roll up our sleeves and, and put our boots on and get, get to work on this. Um, the um, speaking of equity, I you know I, we one thing that came to mind because I we surpassed our Bloomberg goal of you know completing thirty k home energy audits within two years, um, you know and and I noticed that there's a, the equity section empty right this minute. Of course, again this is the first draft, so we you know we know we got some work to do. Um, it was pointed out that the, some of the assessments and inventorying inventory work that we were going to do would take up to uh, up to 2030. You know, it seems like we could do better in that regard. But uh, in particular about these energy audits, I, I just wanted to talk to you talk a little bit about this and, and lead to a larger point. Um, we it just had one done recently and you know, the rebates and the incentives, uh, and maybe this is strictly, you know, thanks to House Bill 6, uh, are geared not based on income, but but on my R value. And so if I have a poor R value, I'm going to get a, a higher incentive or a higher rebate in order to get the work done. And so it's led me to start thinking about our opportunity neighborhoods and where they may be struggling, because that's where we really push those energy audits, for instance. And, you know, that's nice that they get an incentive and they get a rebate, but that doesn't help them get the work done. And so, you know, what are we doing? You know, what what can we do? What have we been doing? You know, what should we be doing in order to help accomplish the goals of making their houses more equitably, equitably you know, sustainable? Um, you know, for instance, thinking about working with economic development, utilizing CDBG dollars uh, so they can actually have the work done and creating programs that really help to push these goals. Thank you, Councilman Rumi. That is a great question. It hits the nail on the head. It's exactly where our aggregation advisory group has been leading us um, to think about, you know, what kinds of sustainability energy efficiency program is really critical for us. Um, what we've learned from other cities is when you are able to, you want to stack programs, right? So if you have investor-owned utilities that have programs that you're able to provide a stacking to, you can you can go further, faster. Um, so what what you identified is exactly what our advisory group members have identified for us, which is, you know, there are folks who are income qualified for weatherization, and that is wonderful. They can get very thorough 
um, measures installed through our weatherization programs, <clears throat> then there are folks who are able, you know, they see the they see that their home has the R values that are qualifying and they really, you know, have the income that enables them to do things. And then there's a huge missing middle in our community, right, of folks that learn that they need these upgrades um, but don't have the financial wherewithal to be able to do the upgrades. And we're even finding this through the equitable engagement that Jenna uh, was discussing earlier. And so that's where, you know, the, the city, as you mentioned, will have to think creatively about what streams of revenue are coming in. How can we leverage those streams of revenue um, to be able to have the greatest impact um, for the folks that really need, that are in that missing middle and that need the measures to be installed to, to be able to have their, their homes um, effectively weatherized. So um, I think the answer is we don't have a solution yet, but we are working with the American Cities Climate Challenge as part of our six month extension to create what they call, it's a fancy word, a wireframe for our program design um, that will hopefully get us to that solution so that we will have a program that's developed that will uh, be able to meet some of the needs that you just discussed. I mean, it's exciting. We had a meeting, um, I don't know what day it is, Tuesday, last week, uh, in regards to a solar co-op, for instance. And, you know, what are the, you know, that's like one of the things that community solar is an opportunity here and something that um, really should be explored. And, and, but again, you don't have all the answers today. I mean, that, that is, uh, I think, you know, our role is to try to create solutions or try to find pathways to encourage this, but um, they're not, the answers aren't all here right this minute. And so um, there's lots of good examples though on, on solar co-ops, especially on the East Coast and some other areas, um, you know, even in Minster, Ohio, for instance. So we'll, we'll uh, continue to work, do that type of work and, and certainly appreciate it. But given that we have a lengthy, uh, uh, group of people to speak tonight. I think uh, we'll move on. And I see my colleagues. I know Councilmember. I saw Councilmember uh, Favor here for a moment, and uh, Councilmember Doran said it's baby duty time. So he is off doing his, you know, taking care of his responsibilities. So uh, let me uh, get back to our script here. Um, we have a number of speakers to share insight on the science and process behind the climate action plan as well as give their own input. So tonight I would like to begin with um, Sarah Spence with the Ohio Envi Environmental Council Action Fund uh, and ask that uh, she give her testimony. Good evening, Ms. Spence. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Chair Remy, members of Columbus City Council Environmental Committee, my name is Sarah Spence and I'm the Director of Climate Programs for the Ohio Environmental Council Action Fund. Part of the OEC Action Fund's mission is to protect and enhance the environment and health of all Ohio communities by advancing critical policy priorities. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony on the draft climate action plan being developed by the City of Columbus. The OEC Action Fund appreciates the continued leadership of the City Administration and City Council in keeping our residents and our environment a priority. Columbus is in a great position to leverage its previous and ongoing work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that first started back in 2005 through a series of green memos and more recently the city's participation in the American Cities Climate Challenge. If a community is going to be successful in not just crafting but also implementing a climate action plan, there must be a concerted, concerted effort to engage a diverse group of stakeholders, local leaders, and the general public throughout the planning and implementation process. The best plans anticipate the needs and desires of all aspects of the community and sustainable Columbus staff, the city council and city administration are doing just that with this plan and we truly appreciate it. The finalized climate action plan should serve as an ambitious roadmap to meet the 2050 carbon neutrality goal and realize community wide benefits. The current September 2020 draft outlines 30 strategies and goals, uh, each under 13 action items divided between five sections of climate leaders, neighborhoods, buildings, transportation, and waste. The draft lays out a good foundation for which to build a more robust climate action plan. 
the OEC Action Fund would like to make a couple of recommendations to improve upon uh, the current draft. Racially marginalized and economically uh, disadvantaged communities lack environmental equity, fair and just access to healthy, breathable air and drinkable water. The most people, or the people impacted most by climate change are often the most vulnerable in our society, and that is true here in Columbus as well. In fact, a 2015 report commissioned by the City of Columbus identified the impacts and the vulnerabilities that Columbus residents face with warming climate. Residents can expect extremely dangerous hot days with additional three to seven weeks per year of temperatures exceeding 90 degrees, deteriorated air quality leading to greater uh, incidence of asthma attacks and other respiratory condition conditions, and potential contamination of water supplies due to storm runoff and sewer overflows. We know that equity is important to the city administration and the city council. Um, however, under the current draft, both kind of optically uh, and substantially, pieces of uh, places equity as one of the last pieces to be drafted in the implementation section. So in order to be more authentically prioritized um, and the equity work that's actually already currently being done, um, we would recommend that this be more prominently woven throughout the narrative within each of the sections of the plan. For target metrics, most of the target metrics in the summary action matrix are due by 2030. With concerted work from advocates, experts, and community members, the OEC Action Fund believes that many of these items can be done before then, either in a 12-month period, a one to three-year timeframe, or a three to five-year timeframe. For example, a nine-year timeline to identify critical gaps in access to public green space and to replace street lights with LED light bulbs seems unnecessarily long. Tightening up some of these timeframes will incentivize feasible actions and will allow the city to move closer to the 2050 target metric sooner. Climate Action Plan correctly makes residential solar priority and an action to increase renewable energy within the city. The 2030 target metric of 10 megawatts of solar um, equates to about 2,500 four kilowatt systems. Um, there are about 375,000 households in Columbus, so this is less than 1% in about 10 years. So we would recommend at least trying to double to 20 megawatts, if not more. This will be an ambitious goal that could be met with concerted work to remove market and regulatory, regulatory barriers that stand in the way of residents investing in rooftop solar. A key step in helping to increase that amount of residential solar would be to identify the artificial barriers and unintended cost increases that many residents have experienced when working with neighborhood commissions and historic districts and making necessary updates to design guidelines. Many of the design guidelines that are currently being used by the commissions and districts were drafted between 2005 and 2011 when solar panels were too cost prohibitive really to be installed by residents. The current design guidelines do not give adequate guidance to homeowners or commission members in striking that balance between starting from a position of yes to residential solar while also still being able to keep the historical character uh, of a district or a structure. And then finally, on the overall carbon reduction goal, as the nation's sixth largest carbon emitter, Ohio is ripe with opportunities to reduce carbon. Cities are responsible for 70% of carbon emissions at the root of the climate crisis. And Ohio cities, like Columbus, are stepping up to reduce their carbon emissions. Reducing Columbus's carbon footprint by 2030 will not be an easy task, but the city has partners and stakeholders standing ready to help move the plan forward. It is OEC Action Fund viewed that this plan could be strengthened if we want to make the necessary progress for the city's goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. Not only does the city have excellent staff and engaged stakeholders that will be involved in the effort, there are other cities in Ohio that can be great collaborators with Columbus. The city of Euclid, for example, is working to reduce their carbon footprint by 30% by 2030. The city of Cincinnati created the Green Cincinnati Plan in 2018 with more than 80 recommendations to get 40% carbon reduction by 2028 and 84% by 2050. The more aggressive carbon reduction sub-goals can help achieve the overall goal. So for example, the current plan calls for a 10% reduction in com commercial energy use by 2030. Currently, commercial buildings are seeing anywhere from a 10 to 50% reduction in energy use after an energy audit followed by recommendation implementation. So the 10% reduction is on the low end of the scale and could easily and reasonably be increased to at least 20%. While increasing the percentage target goal reduction may seem like a stretch, it sets the stage for advocates, experts, and community members to help the city achieve community greenhouse gas reductions that align with science-backed greenhouse gas target goals 
while also creating a more equitable and resilient community. Again, thank you for holding this public hearing to provide additional opportunity for input from the community. We believe that the city is on the right track to create a meaningful climate action plan that can be improved through further collaboration and input from residents and stakeholders. And the OEC Action Fund is ready to, to help with this process as well. Thank you, Sarah. We appreciate your testimony this evening. Uh, I'm going to keep things moving. We will obviously, this will include the speakers that we have later as well. We'll get back with everyone, but uh, I'm not going to turn it over for questions just in interest of time. Uh, next, we have from Swaco, Jeff Wilkins. And uh, we also have Waste 360's 40 Under 40 award recipient, Kyle O'Keefe, here this evening. And so uh, I'll turn it over. Thank you, Councilmember Remy. You're you're too kind. Um, and uh, as Councilmember stated, uh, I'm Kyle O'Keefe, Director of Innovation and Programs. Hopefully, you can uh, hear me all right. Um, I'd just like to start by saying we commend the City of Columbus for the development of this Climate Action Plan. It's a amazing document and, and foundational, seminal piece of work. Uh, the, the plan itself really sets the tone and visibility for one of the most critical issues that our community faces, which is mitigating climate change. Um, and, and this plan as well is multifaceted and doesn't just benefit the city, but it also benefits the entire region, all the surrounding communities that are working on similar issues. And furthermore, the plan recognizes the importance and the benefits of reducing waste and increasing the diversion of materials from the solid waste uh, stream. And also sets specific goals around uh, reducing and diverting organic waste, recyclables, and supporting a regional circular economy. All these things are, are you know, fundamental to reducing our overall climate impacts. Uh, Swaco also has goals that kind of combine with the city's action plan. Uh, we've got a regional goal of achieving a 75% diversion rate by the year 2032. Um, this is part of the city of Columbus, our surrounding communities, all of Franklin County for that matter. So these goals directly align and support each other. And also through this collaboration, I mean, we can really take a, a resource that's being wasted currently and really turn that into valuable jobs and products that not only benefit our environment, but also our economy. Uh, we've been able to document hundreds of local businesses here in Franklin County and surrounding region that use these materials to support these jobs and, and use it to create new products in our community really strengthening the circular economy. So um, we think this is a wonderful step forward uh, for the city, for the region, um, and greatly appreciate uh, the work that uh, everyone is doing uh, to advance this. So now I'm gonna actually turn it over to my colleague, uh, Jeff Wilkins, um, to add a few additional comments. Thanks. Great, thanks Kyle. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me. I started hit my uh, share video, but uh, I don't think it's working, but uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, Oh, uh, again, thanks, uh, Council Member uh, Remy. We we uh, we had a similar process here at Swaco. Uh, you know, we set a, a carbon emissions a high level goal back in 2017 uh, to reduce our carbon footprint, and we went through uh, again something similar to to uh, what you're doing um, and uh, set our goal back in in 2020 uh, that was approved by by the board. And what we what we found. Uh, um, is that we could be carbon neutral in all of our operations, let's say our buildings, our, our, uh, our fleet, uh, even our, our waste management and, and such, but uh, it's really the, uh, the, the uh, emissions that is attributed to us is really at the landfill. So as, as Kyle was saying, uh, that's not, well, that's 96% of our, our emissions. So any, uh, any efforts to uh, reduce waste, uh, to the landfill not only helps uh, uh, the whole region's carbon footprint, it helps helps our carbon footprint too, but it also extends the life of uh, of the, the landfill. So that's uh, so any synergies that we uh, can can uh, create with you, uh, we're definitely uh, supportive of. And Kyle had mentioned the uh, circular economy. Uh, we are in the process uh, of um, working with the economic developers of the region as well as uh, utilizing our our land. Uh, uh, just north of the landfill, to hopefully create a, a green economy business park that uh, would contribute to uh, the circular economy. 
uh, what we're trying to uh, with that in general is is uh, increase the demand for recycled products. You're seeing more and more uh, corporations that that uh, are using recycled content. We want to uh, try to attract the the, uh, the entire supply chain uh, to uh, to not just our area but to the whole region. And that's why we're working with uh, all the economic developers uh, so we can attract to uh, other sites other than the, j just our our area. So. Um, this is just a, a few comments. Definitely uh, uh, encouraged by what what you're doing, and I um, think that uh, I think we're all pointed in, in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, I know we've got a very strong partnership, and and the importance of you know the you guys were the number one emitter of methane gas, and and because of your diversion efforts um, have. have Thankfully, not topping that list anymore. But that that also shows the importance of recycling. Um, that you know, we we need to strengthen in this plan, and uh, you know, make sure that there's a strong commitment. And of course, we have one of the best administrators, Tim Swagger, um, who to partner with here at the city. Um, also, wanted to um, just ask a couple. Of, I know I said something about keeping this moving, but I am going to ask a couple questions of you two real quick. Um, what it, what else could we do to help reach and achieve your goals? And secondly, could you just talk a little bit about how this landfill captures its methane gas? We sell it, uh, or you guys sell it. It helps keep tipping fees low for a city that, you know, doesn't charge residents in addition for trash. Um, one of the reasons that we're able to do that is because of the way that you 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 make money off the methane that that is created at the landfill. So if you could help with that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. We can respond to that now. Um, just on your on your latter point there, uh, yeah, we we do try to manage the landfill with best practices, um, as you mentioned, and. We put a lot of time and energy to sort of make sure that it's uh, reducing its environmental footprint as best as possible. Uh, as you mentioned, we've got a very robust gas collection system at the landfill that actually basically sucks up all of that methane as much as it can. Uh, and we work with a company that's on site uh, at the landfill that converts that that gas into a cleaner gas product and pumps it directly into the Columbia gas pipeline. So uh, in turn, that's creating a lot of energy for our homes and our community as well. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, while we're capturing a lot of that, met that methane, you know, we don't capture all of it, right? So uh, by further doing activities like reducing the amount of food waste that we're putting into the waste stream, um, helping to advance composting solutions, we can even cut that down even more uh, to your point. So we need all of these types of solutions to really uh, succeed. Um, and then also there are, you know, many opportunities for collaboration. You mentioned we have a strong partnership with the city already. We work closely with him and many others at the city. Um, and we're already planning pilot projects uh, right now, even for this year, that will help to advance the city uh, accomplishing this goal, um, including, as I think you're aware of, uh, working with multifamily units uh, throughout the city, um, doing more education uh, with residents uh, throughout all communities and neighborhoods uh, in the city. Um, but also looking at other future policies too, right? Um, we have to be thinking five and 10 years down the road. I know over the next decade is when you have a lot of these goals uh, to achieve. So um, really we, we see a strong partnership. The only way that we can achieve our goals is by helping you achieve your goals and vice versa. So I think we're all in this together and um, a really exciting time to be working on these issues. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, you know, you guys mentioned the economic development side of things uh, with green the green economy basically but this is also a really really great time for workforce development roles um, because there's going to be a lot of jobs associated with the type of work that's that's occurring so it's it's definitely exciting thank you both of you and uh appreciate the ongoing partnership uh next we have uh speaker leo almeida the from the nature conservancy conservancy so uh leo welcome looking forward to your testimony Good evening. Uh, Chairperson Remy and members of the Environment Committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of the city's climate action plan. I'm Leo Almeida and I'm a senior policy associate at the Nature Conservancy in Ohio. 
The Nature Conservancy is a nonpartisan science-based organization that seeks to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. We have chapters in all 50 states and work in over 70 countries across the globe. We work collaboratively with businesses, farmers, sportsmen groups, government, and local communities to develop pragmatic market-based solutions to conservation challenges, including air pollution. More than 65,000 Ohioans are TNC supporters. Scientific consensus is that climate change is not a distant threat. It is happening now. We commend the city of Columbus for being a leader in addressing some of the root causes of human-induced climate change. We are glad to see the city continue to work toward its goal of going 100% renewable through community choice aggregation and being carbon neutral by 2050. The initiatives outlined in the city's climate action plan are important steps toward adapting and mitigating climate change and reaching carbon neutrality. In reviewing the climate action plan, we noticed several areas of important work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including energy, transportation, and natural climate solutions. In addition to going 100% renewable, the city is on the right path to reducing energy consumption through energy efficiency. The cleanest and cheapest form of energy is the energy we don't use. Working with residents and businesses to educate communities about opportunities to reduce their carbon footprint by evaluating their energy use through energy audits and tracking gets everyone involved in the solution. Furthermore, we agree with your proposal to increase resources for property assessed clean energy financing to help reduce the cost of energy efficiency retrofits, which has already seen success in reducing energy consumption and saving money on monthly utility bills for both residents and business owners. As the Climate Action Plan correctly notes, there is a need for state policies to align with low carbon resilient solutions. TNC will continue to work with partners like the City of Columbus to advocate for state level energy policies to lead Ohio into a low carbon future. Another important aspect of this plan is focus on transportation. TNC is committed to working to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions necessary to keep the planet below a two degrees Celsius threshold of warming. This means working to reduce emissions from the top two highest emitting sectors in the United States, energy and transportation. As outlined in the Climate Action Plan, there are numerous ways to address this issue by increasing the use of electric vehicles. As the city has already recognized through Smart Columbus, there is a need to reduce barriers for private use of EVs, including reducing the cost of ownership and charging infrastructure. Columbus residents who participate in community choice aggregation and own an EV will be able to further decrease their carbon footprint by having their vehicles charged by renewable energy. We are also glad to see the city committed to replacing older vehicles with zero carbon passenger fleets. Encouraging the use of mass transit and fleet electrification will not only give people in Columbus more mobility options, it will also play a significant role in emissions reduction from the transportation sector. Lastly, the Climate Action Plan includes a commitment to implement land use planning strategies for healthy ecosystems. As outlined in the plan, Columbus continues to increase equitable access to green space and utilize tree canopy to reduce urban heat. Green space and trees can be used for both climate adaptation and mitigation. TNC is committed to demonstrating that cities can become more resilient with strong nature-based climate solutions. We would encourage the city to include even more of these nature-based solutions in the climate action plan. Increased severe weather events that lead to flood, heat stress, and poor air quality cause negative economic impacts to people and property. Investing in natural infrastructure to address climate change is a cost-effective approach that also meets growing infrastructure demands. Uh, whether used alone or with great infrastructure, nature-based solutions like wetlands, rain gardens, and replacing trees and other vegetation have been proven to generate significant protection benefits and avoid financial losses for communities. As the population continues to grow in Columbus, there will be a need to invest more in building, repairing, and enhancing all types of infrastructure. When making these investments in infrastructure, the city should also invest in nature-based infrastructure. Doing so will enhance the resilience of infrastructure and deliver a host of benefits such as flood risk reduction, pollution abatement, and recreational opportunities that typical gray infrastructure alone does not deliver. 
While investing in renewable energy and charging infrastructure for EVs are powerful drivers of, of sustainable economic growth, they're also an investment in our health. This climate action plan comes at, at a crucial time as we continue to experience the impacts of climate change, which has led to record-breaking changes in weather patterns as 2019 concluded the hottest decade ever recorded. In addition to stressing natural habitats, higher temperatures from air quality as emissions from cars, industry, and other sources mixed with heat and lead to ground level ozone, which can pose serious risks, especially to those with respiratory conditions like asthma. Without question, access to clean air is an environmental determinant of health and environmental justice. By increasing renewable energy use and energy efficiency, adopting new technology and practices in transportation, and implementing natural climate solutions, we can decrease emissions to improve air quality and other climate change impacts in central Ohio. We fully agree with the description of this plan as being a living document that will need to be adjusted as new and better opportunities to address climate change become available. TNC looks forward to continue working with the city of Columbus to address climate change and become an even more resilient and sustainable city. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony and support of the Climate Action Plan, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Leo. We appreciate your advocacy and always a pleasure to hear from the Nature Conservancy, so thanks again. Uh, our next speaker is Bruce Harkey from the Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens. Bruce, welcome. There we go. Sorry about that. You think we would new, learn how to unmute after all these years. Um, thank you, Councilmember Remy, for um, holding this, uh, this opportunity for all of us to learn a little bit more about the climate plan for the city of Columbus. Um, the conservatory is a member of the American Public Gardens Association, and we have over 900 members across the country. And for years, we've been talking about the opportunity for botanical gardens to be the place where the community is connected um, and hears about these issues. And I think all of these, these plans are great. And I would encourage us to think about ways to connect with the community, particularly the young kids in our communities. Um, they're the ones who are going to own the world that we are leaving them. Uh, and when the conservatory opened the children's garden in 2018, we started community days uh, once a month. And I think there's a great opportunity with the 300,000 visitors the conservatory gets um, to really help educate the next generation. So I would offer that up as an opportunity, not only the conservatory, but places like COSA. I think we can make a real difference in taking um, these very complex topics and bringing them to uh, the general public to make sure that they're engaged and supportive of these initiatives. And the conservatory's vision is a world that celebrates nature as essential to the human experience. And the message that we're trying to get to our get across to our visitors is that without plants, there is no human life. And while that seems very basic, there are a lot of people who don't who don't understand that. And certainly COVID has helped all of us realize the importance of nature. So again, I think there's a great opportunity to really engage the community in this very important work. Um, I was involved um, with the tree canopy project. And so I really appreciate the commitment to climate and also racial equity. Um, and one of the conversations that we had is how do we increase the tree canopy in underserved neighborhoods? And I think this is a great example of the challenge that we're gonna face. I was speaking to um, a friend who lives on the Near East Side and mentioned the goal to increase the tree canopy. And his response was, my father cut down all the trees because they were too expensive and too much work. And so I think that is the harsh reality of what we're facing as a community is that we need to resolve those economic challenges in order to move this really ambitious um, and wonderful plan forward. Um, the conservatory has been involved uh, for decades with our national peers in important initiatives like community gardening. And I really love the, the comment that was made previously about nature-based infrastructure. If we can elevate the importance of community gardening and composting, I think that will make a significant difference in moving um, these initiatives along. Um, we've been participating in the city's initiative since 2015 uh, and uh, have taken a number of leadership positions and 
really appreciate the opportunity to partner with the city. I think the plan is great. Um, we strongly support the plan and the continued partnership with the city of Columbus. Um, I particularly like the intersection of racial equity and climate change. I think that is so important and, and it's something that we need to continue advocating in the community. Um, we'll continue working with you and um, I've really appreciated all um, of the presentations today. I've learned a lot and think there's so much that we can all do working together to move this plan forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce, and thank you for the work that you do with the Franklin Park Conservatory. It's a, a wonderful organization. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Dr. Elena Irwin from the Sustainability Institute at The Ohio State University. Dr. Irwin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Remy and members of the Environment Committee. Greatly appreciate the opportunity here to speak today and for you to hold this important hearing um, on the proposed climate action plan and to express our strong support for the plan. Uh, my name is Alina Irwin and I serve as uh, both the faculty director for the Sustainability Institute here at Ohio State. I'm also a professor of environmental economics in the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at Ohio State. Thank you to the city and to the city council for your leadership in advancing equitable climate change solutions for the Columbus community by reducing harmful carbon emissions and adapting to our region's changing climate. The plan really out, uh, outlines an important and ambitious set of goals uh, that are important not just for the city but for the region and for the nation and really for our world. We also commend Mayor Ginther for his leadership and partnership in fighting the effects of climate change here in central Ohio. At Ohio State, we're also trying to do our part. Uh, the Sustainability Institute is responsible for integrating an interdisciplinary approach to sustainability across the core functions of the university, research, teaching and learning, community outreach and engagement, as well as campus operations. And in this role, we help the university achieve its uh, adopted sustainability goals, many of them across the mission of the university that include a longstanding commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, more recently, the Sustainability Institute led the university's efforts to, uh, to update our climate action plan. And we outlined uh, not only how we could achieve this long-term carbon neutrality goal, but also how the university could address 55% of its cur current carbon emissions reduction by 2030. So the city's carbon neutrality goal that is outlined here in the proposed plan really aligns very well with the Ohio State University's climate action goals. And in this regard, it's really exciting to see the city has worked so quickly on developing the proposed plan that's now under consideration. We were honored to provide input uh, on the proposed plan through our participation on the Sustainable Columbus External Advisory Committee, along with many other community stakeholders. Columbus is one of the fastest growing Midwest cities. It has really got a special place uh, in the Midwest and its commitment to carbon neutrality, therefore, is absolutely essential. It's also ambitious. Uh, the proposed plan lays out a really intelligent approach uh, that will serve a strong uh, an initial roadmap for the region to increase its effort to achieve carbon neutrality. Particularly the plan's uh, energy related recommendations that aim to stabilize energy costs uh, are absolutely essential while also catalyzing the new economic development in central Ohio around a long term clean energy future. It's absolutely essential as we know from looking at uh, regional growth um, determinants, uh, making our city clean and making our city appealing uh, to others is an essential uh, strategy. We also know that systemic inequality and racism are exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. Uh, for just one example, one study fa has found that low-income areas in cities across the U.S. have been found to be anywhere from five to 12 degrees hotter than higher income neighborhoods because they have fewer trees and parks, more asphalt, uh, and more impervious surfaces that retain heat. This plan acknowledges these unequal impacts uh, on our community's most vulnerable citizens and smartly outlines actions to improve climate resilience for historically underserved communities in ways that will improve public health as well as ensure equitable distribution of benefits. Making consistent progress towards the climate action targets that are outlined 
will require appropriate metrics as well as ongoing data collection. It will require scenario planning and iterative evaluation supported by data analysis. Ohio State has experts in these areas. We also have many passionate students who are eager to help with these and other tasks. And in fact, we've partnered with the city for a number of years on engaging our students, including those from the environment, economy, development, and sustainability major in projects through capstone courses that have helped the city analyze its progress in a number of different sustainability domains. From these capstone projects to our involvement in Smart Columbus and the proposed Climate Action Plan, Ohio State has enjoyed and benefited from its partnership with the city on sustainability and climate related issues. We strongly support the proposed plan and are firmly committed to the continued partnership with the city as the plan continues to develop and adaptively evolves over the coming years as strategies are implemented, new technologies are adopted, new markets emerge, and new challenges are faced. Thank you for the opportunity to express our support for this critically important work. Thank you very much, Dr. Irwin. We appreciate the partnership and certainly the input that your office and, and the Ohio State team have. Thank you for stepping in tonight to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening and fighting the efforts, um, the effects of climate change in Central Ohio. We believe the proposed climate action plan will help serve as a roadmap for the region to reach carbon neutrality. We strongly support the developing plan and look forward to continued partnership with the city in this regard, especially on mobility and transportation issues. At CODA, clean air is a vital part of a thriving community, and we know that in general. Transit can help reduce air pollution by reducing single occupancy vehicle trips using alternative fuel vehicles. Reduced single occupancy vehicle trips, driving only with one person in the car is bad for the environment and it can be isolating to, for our residents. We make CODA a convenient and reliable option for our customers who want to meet their neighbors and take a stand for the environment. Reduce emissions is really important to us. We are intentional in our work to reduce our emissions and keep the air clean. In pursuit of that goal, CODA is switching to fleets um, from diesel to compressed natural gas buses um, to conserve re resources and support community health and welfare. Additionally, our journey to switch to electric vehicles begins this year. 65% of CODA's fleets are low emissions. 10 electrical vehicles will be purchased um, this starting this year and into 2022. And 20 to 8 CNG buses per year um, are being purchased so that we're diesel free by 2025. Our annual report and our sustainability re report will be published very soon, so keep an eye out for that. Um, additionally, we're down in two areas, 1.32 uh, tons reduction in part, uh, particular matter and 14.98 ton reduction in um, nitrogen oxi oxide. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, CODA has become one of only two transit agencies in the United States to earn the prestigious Global Bio Risk um, Accreditation. Uh, and so this accreditation is committing us to provide safe environment for transit customers and employees. Um, so this GBAC, uh, GBAC, is the cleaning industry's gold standard uh, for preferred facilities, prepared facilities, and only outbreak prevention res response recovery accreditation for facilities. We believe that developing climate this climate action plan will take into account hard hit and vulnerable historically underserved communities in our region and that it will help improve public health and promote biodiversity. Lastly, we also believe this developing plan will, when carried out, help stabilize energy costs and become an economic development and economic engine and will put forth trans, uh, transportation and mobility solutions that will make sense and help protect our environment. And I know that I stand between you and actually good weather, so I will say thank you so much for allowing me to provide this testimony this evening, um, and we look forward to continuing uh, this great work alongside you. Thank you, Asleen. I was tempted to do it outside, but um, I figured the cr the noise would maybe be a little bit too much, but I get to see the sunset at least. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. It, it was a pleasure to hear your testimony and certainly uh, the input provided will be, um, you know, recorded and, and taken into consideration. 
Um, we appreciate the ongoing support. This evening, we have 18 speakers who reached out to my office ahead of the public hearing to provide uh, spoken testimony, as well as over 15 people who submitted written testimony. Thank you to everyone who is providing testimony tonight. So we are gonna begin uh, with our first speaker, and I wanna remind everyone that you have three minutes to speak. Uh, again, we won't be commenting on the testimony, but certainly we will be reporting it. So uh, let me see here. I have got, you guys are listening to my call coming in. Sorry about that. Uh, the first um, person that we have tonight is Ayla Bella. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Council Member Remy, members of the Columbus City Council and representatives of the Office of Sustainability, thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. My name is Isla Bella. I am a resident of Columbus and a student at Ohio State University, and I am really delighted to be hearing all of the ideas that are coming out at this forum. Um, I wanna thank everyone who has worked on this climate action plan for their efforts toward adapting to and mitigating the climate crisis. This document will not only help us make great strides in creating a sustainable Columbus, it will improve the lives of Columbus residents and could even serve as a reference for other cities looking to enhance their environmental efforts. It is for these reasons that I think it is imperative to include more ambitious goals for watershed restoration and management. I emailed many city councilors and representatives of the Office of Sustainability with my concerns about watersheds, including soil erosion, honeysuckle proliferation, and sewage overflow. The response I received about this last concern excited me. I was informed of a $2 billion investment over 25 years to upgrade Columbus's sewer and water waste management. I believe this project will greatly improve the health of our watersheds, but stopping the damage is not enough. We need to be rehabilitating them. I believe there are organizations working to do this, such as Friends of the Lower Olentangy Watershed, but restoring all of Columbus's watersheds is too big a project to leave up to them. Because watershed restoration is so critical in mitigating increased flooding risks, I propose a goal to have 100% of Columbus watersheds restored by 2050. I would leave it to the experts to determine what constitutes restoration, but I would imagine it would include honeysuckle being kept at a manageable level, soil erosion being stable, and vegetation increasing rather than decreasing. This can also help Columbus with its carbon neutrality goal, as healthy watersheds are likely to pull far more carbon from the air than dwindling ones. And if the city wants to kill three birds with one stone, it's even possible to look into creating food forests like they have in Georgia and Colorado in watershed areas, which would provide countless benefits to the land, air, water, and community. Food forests are incredible resources. They use sustainable farming practices to establish forest-like areas consisting of edible and medicinal plants, vines, shrubs, and trees. They're often volunteer-based, which provides a great opportunity for building community. They provide access to healthy, fresh food, and if done right, they can capture carbon from the air and store it in the soil. This is in addition to all of the benefits of standard forests. Creating food forests in Columbus, whether inside or outside of watershed restoration projects, could provide countless benefits to our city. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify this evening. If you have interest in discussing these issues further, one of the advocacy groups that I'm affiliated with is hosting an event next Friday at one o'clock outside the State House. While it will have a protest format, it will include many of these issues. And if anyone would like to be considered to speak at this event, you can reach me at ilabella135 at gmail.com. I am very eager to see how the city will restore and utilize our invaluable watersheds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the testimony this evening, Isla. Um, we will uh, definitely take that and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch or look forward to a good relationship moving forward. I apologize. Um, our next speaker is Kathy Cohen Becker. Please uh, state your name, Kathy, and any group that you're associated with. And of course, you have three minutes. Sure. Um, my name is Kathy Cowan Becker, and I'm chair of Ready for 100 in Ohio. Um, so, Council Member Remy and members of Columbus City Council, thank you for holding this hearing to gather public input on the draft climate action plan. We've been talking to the city for years about our carbon footprint. We encouraged the city to implement aggregation for 100% renewable energy two years ago, and we're thrilled to see voters approve it by a landslide in November. 
We know the city can think big about climate because they already have. Aggregation alone will reduce our emissions by 1.2 million tons or about 12%. So we'll need big thinking like this to address the climate crisis. Cities are responsible for 70% of carbon emissions and Columbus is the 14th largest city in the country. So what we do matters. The IPCC has said we must cut carbon emissions basically in half by 2030 if we want a livable planet. But the draft climate plan does not think big enough. It calls for cutting our emissions by only 25%. The plan has 30 goals in five areas, and if you look at these goals, you can see why the overall goal is low. Many of the sub-goals are also low. So some examples, the draft plan calls for only a 10% reduction in energy use in buildings by 2030, but if we doubled those goals, we could potentially reach the same amount of carbon savings as aggregation. The plan calls for four city buildings to be zero carbon by 2030, but zero carbon design incentives for all new buildings should be in place by 2030. The plan calls for only 10 megawatts of residential solar by 2030, but Los Angeles installed 250 megawatts in five years. If we raised our goal to 200 megawatts, that would put solar on 40,000 more homes. The plan calls for only 10% of car sales to be electric by 2030, but projections show 26% of vehicle sales in 2030 will be electric, and we should be able to beat that. And the plan calls for piloting 30 heavy-duty electric vehicles by 2030 but half the world's buses will be electric by 2025 and electric buses save, save Chicago $54,000 each. So we should be aiming to make half our bus fleet electric by 2030. So a climate plan is not just about emissions, but also about equity. And to its credit, the draft climate action plan does tackle equity, but again, many things are too little too late. So for example, the plan seeks to conduct a physical vulnerability assessment, map resiliency hubs, and identify gaps in access to green space. But it gives the city until 2030 just to do the assessments and not actually fix the problems until 2050. We should do the assessments in just a couple of years and fix the problems by 2030. And the plan is also missing several key programs such as green space, green roofs, community gardens, community solar, and replacing lead pipes. We support the city's efforts to create a climate action plan, but we must think big and bold. Now is not the time for setting small goals because we think they are safe. Goals not in line with the science are not safe. We have a small window of time to get this done and the fate of human civilization and life on earth depends on us getting it right. Thank you so much, Kathy. We appreciate your continued advocacy. Uh, our next speaker is Doug Todd. Doug, uh, you have three minutes. Please state your name and any uh, organization you may be associated with. Uh, my name is Doug Todd. Do you hear me? Okay, so I'm on, I'm on mute. Yes, yeah. you're good. Uh, I was formerly with the Central Ohio Green Education Fund. I was president of that organization. And um, I was also active in Sierra, Sierra Club previously. And I worked for the city of Columbus for a while. So. Uh, Anyways, I am glad you guys are doing this. The city of Columbus is catching up with things. And um, I have intermittently been a resident of Columbus all my life. As a preface, I want to commend the city of Columbus for directly addressing the climate crisis in the draft Columbus Climate Action Plan. The plan itself is excellent in its breadth and depth with which it addresses critical climate issues. I think it's a great start. However, given the growing gravity of the climate crisis, we believe the response must be bolder. It is clear that Mayor Ginther and other city leaders agree uh, with us that the climate conditions are rapidly moving um, to dangerous levels. Even the most modest solutions proposed under the current plan will take a lot of time, time that we may honestly not have. The Department of Energy estimates that buildings consume 38% of all energy and 71% of all electricity in the United States. This figure can be reduced by 21% using currently available Energy Star technology and by 46% using best available technology. There is great room for a significant improvement with large buildings. 
The current CAP goals propose the following. Reductions of building energy, 20% municipal by 2030, 10% commercial energy by 2030, 30% residential by 2050, and 50% commercial by 2050. Other cities are doing more, and we can too. For example, Washington, D.C. will have net zero design standards by 2026. Portland will require all new buildings will be net zero by, net zero by 2030. And New York, new York City will require all buildings, both old and new, to be net zero by 2050. Columbus could have zero carbon design standards by 2025. Then incentivize developers to make all new buildings net zero by 2030 and all buildings net zero by 2050. Buildings are the top source of carbon emissions in Columbus. So moving to net zero buildings will go a long way to reducing emissions. On a personal note, I once worked for the city of Columbus myself. During that time, I worked at 71 North Front Street, which used to be the old police headquarters. This building has been remodeled to meet LEED standards and is therefore a stellar example of what Columbus is going to do when it puts his mind to it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank you very much, Mr. Todd. We appreciate the testimony this evening. Um, our next speaker is Aaron Newman. Aaron, welcome back to council. And please state your name and any association that you may have. Thank you very much, Council Member Remy, uh, for holding today's session. Uh, my name is Aaron Newman with the Far Northwest Coalition. Uh, thanks also to Lucy, as always, for the invite, and thanks to uh, a lot of Jen and Aaron and all the Columbus staff and officials for the hard work on this important topic. Uh, folks in the Far Northwest are always happy to provide feedback and insights on such city initiatives. So. Uh, the Far Northwest Coalition held a special session in January to discuss the action plan, uh, the climate action plan, and we got some great feedback that we forwarded on. Uh, we also encouraged our board members and residents to share their ideas through the uh, Climate Action Columbus survey. Hopefully uh, you received some more insights there. Um, our neighbors were excited to consider a sustainable future and uh, proud, of course, to see Columbus taking such an active role in shaping the path ahead. Uh, the benefits of cleaner air and water would be enough to warrant excitement, but uh, the additional benefits of a closer connected city and stronger business community make it all the more appealing. We would welcome a range of city actions to support these goals as discussed at our session, uh, including supporting or subsidizing updates to efficient appliances or windows or other fixtures, especially for the uh, elderly, differently abled or low income neighbors who would maybe like to make these improvements but need a hand. And we'd also uh, recommend uh, more promotion of the Climate Action Plan, Green Spot Program, and other Columbus initiatives and guidance. Um, you guys do a great job already, but um, as we all know, there's always one or two more folks we can reach. So um, however we can reach them would be great. Um, the far northwest, we're a little more suburban than some other parts of the city, so pretty reliant on cars out here. But we would, uh, of course, welcome expanded transportation offerings. Um, from Coda that would connect us not only to downtown, but also Dublin, Worthington, and the other closer commercial and entertainment centers up around in our area. And uh, of course, we're looking forward to uh, the support for local business that will come with the Climate Action Plan, and we would welcome any uh, steps for Columbus to attract the companies that are leading these industries of the future, as well as fostering the human capital found here in central Ohio to grow our own great talent. Um, again, shared some other insights and feedback earlier uh, after our, our session in January, but um, we're always happy to provide more feedback. So uh, we appreciate again the opportunity to talk today on behalf of the residents of Far Northwest. Um, feel free to reach out if there's anything more that I or the coalition can do to help promote the Climate Action Plan moving ahead. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Thanks, Aaron. We appreciate your testimony this evening. Uh, next, we have Chuck Lind. Welcome, Chuck. Please state your name and any group you may be associated with. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. My name is Chuck Lind. I'm a resident of Columbus. I drive an electric car. My wife and I have a 
net metering agreement with AEP for rooftop solar. I serve on the Northland Advisory Committee. I'm a founding member of Simply Living, and I'm a board member of the Ohio Sustainable Business Council. I'm delighted that the city of Columbus is formalizing plans to address the climate crisis. The draft climate action plan includes residential and commercial solar, both with modest goals that should be improved. I propose that the plan should add a new category, community solar, and set a goal to establish model projects that can be replicated in opportunity neighborhoods. Community solar picks up where traditional rooftop solar isn't available. How does it work? The Institute for Local Self-Reliance explains, through community solar, individuals subscribe to a portion of a nearby solar project and get credits on their energy bill for the electricity it produces. This way, people without the financial means for solar on their rooftops and people who don't own suitable rooftops can still reap the benefits of renewable energy. Local governments and installers can go even further to include subscribers with poor credit or use local installers on the project. At the present time, legal constraints limit AEP from installing community solar projects. This should change, but until then, there is an alternative. The Columbus Division of Power could develop community solar projects. Simply Living is aware of a grassroots project led by Art Yoho and other neighbors on East Cook Road and Mays Road in Columbus. The group is working with property owners who own large three to four acre homes in the area and the nearby Columbus Global Academy, an international high school that serves many new American immigrants in Northland. In addition, the group is working with Design Energy, a local company with the expertise required to design community solar systems. Columbus is fortunate to have its own municipal power company. Design Energy has earned national recognition for their work on the microgrid system serving the entire community of Minster, Ohio, including power for two local plants. The local community group shows there is interest in developing community solar. We have all the elements needed to design and install a project that could serve as a model for other neighborhoods. By adding community solar to the climate action plan, Columbus can increase renewable energy while addressing the important issue of environmental justice in Columbus opportunity neighborhoods. Thank you for your commitment to taking action on the climate crisis. Thank you, Chuck. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Our next speaker is Klaus Ecker. Klaus, welcome back to council. You have three minutes, please state your name and any group you're associated with. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank council member Remy and the whole committee today for the opportunity to speak. My name is Klaus Eckert. I'm the executive director of Green Columbus. This year, we will plant and distribute 65,000 trees during Earth Month. Most of them, unfortunately, outside of Columbus city limits. I applaud the city's effort to create a climate action plan and support the process wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, the current plan might still be underserving our community by not having the most ambitious science-based targets that we need to achieve carbon goals by 2050. Let us not mince words. Columbus is not a leader in the environmental world. Yet, today, we still live in a developer first place that is built around the car with limited protections for trees and green spaces while polluting the world in excess. An ambitious science-based climate action plan could change that. We can make the city more people focused with a strong sense of community and equity and with future generations in mind. You have many passionate and dedicated allies and together we can make a difference and bring our mission levels down to where we need them. But we really need to want that. We need to say yes to climate goals that will help minorities and historically underserved communities in Columbus. I'm personally worried that the plan's current targets are simply not sufficient and will hurt us and future generations 
unnecessarily. Many targets need to be increased significantly. I advocate to adjust the 2030 targets based on what science tells us we need to do now and make sure that those targets will be reflected in future budgets. I love working with the city and many of our organization's favorite partners and friends are from the city. So I say this as a friend of Columbus and out of concern. Let's not punt the necessary actions into the future, but run with a more ambitious science-based climate action plan and tackle the problems of climate change for our community now. With that, I thank you very much. I thank the city, everyone involved in participating in that endeavor of creating a climate action plan. And I just wanted to provide some pep talk to get us a little further, a little faster. And I'm looking forward to participating and implementing to my personal abilities and at Green Columbus at large. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus. We appreciate your testimony this evening. Uh, our next speaker is Jasmine Ayers. Welcome back to council, Jasmine. Please state your name and any group you may be associated with. Uh, thank you, council member Remy. Uh, my name is Jasmine Ayers. I am a North London area commissioner and also um, the community engagement officer for New Salem CDC. Um, I'll try to be quick. Uh, as of 2017, about 30,000 Columbus homes have lead service lines. It would cost about $150 million to replace all of the lines that are in use across the city, according to Matt Steele. Most of the lead infrastructure is, common, is concentrated in older areas of the city, primarily off High and Broad Street. I would like to ask for the testing of water and high concentration lead pipe areas to be added to the climate action plan. I applaud the efforts around the interactive map, but as we were reminded this year, parents and families have a lot going on and checking a city map is not likely their priority. And even if they did check, what are they supposed to do to follow up? Uh, accessible information doesn't just mean it's posted on a website. Consider CODA buses, social media, billboards, grocery coupons, and community partners. Additionally, I would like to advocate for an alert system that is sent to all phones in Columbus when there is a potential water contamination. This summer, many of my neighbors did not know we had a boil water advisory, and only because I spend entirely too much time on Twitter did I know. Uh, it's, compli it's complicated cannot be an excuse for not ensuring one of the most basic human rights, access to clean drinking water. I know we have the brain trust inside of City Hall to get this done. Uh, I also want to mention a community partner, uh, Community Renewable Energy, that is in conversation with churches in Linden because a lot of them have flat rooftops uh, to get solar panels, sort of like community solar going in Linden. I think this is the perfect neighborhood to get that going. I think you can hire people from the community to install them and to teach them a new skill. Um, so I would recommend connecting with them and also New Salem on this. Uh, and then another thing, um, I don't think that we think about home ownership as being tied to um, energy and climate, um, but the more um, African-American families that can own land, the more that they can grow their own food, uh, which I think is sort of really important to think when you're thinking about equity. Um, and I just, I also wanted to mention, I obviously can't see the rest of the sort of public speakers, uh, but I don't think there was a single black person that gave testimony tonight besides myself. Uh, and so we have to engage African-Americans beyond just surveying them. Um, there are black scientists here. Um, the Northland STEM Club is one of the best in the United States. They travel all around the country winning competitions. I'm sure those young people would have lots of thoughts on how to do really cool um, sort of reduction of CO2 emissions. So I really encourage you to not just think about community engagement at sort of the basic level, but including those voices in every single step of the way. Um, thank you very much for my time. Um, I am extremely appreciative that we got this passed this year. Um, and I look forward to all the cool stuff that we're gonna be able to do. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. We appreciate the testimony this evening. Um, was able to go through the North Linden, or not the North Linden, the Linden Recreation Center. And uh, man, talk about some food opportunities with the kitchen that they put in that thing it is really impressive so 
can't wait for more people to get the opportunity to see it. Uh, our next speaker this evening is Curtis Walker Jr. Mr. Walker, welcome to council. Please state your name in any group that you may be associated with. Good evening, Council Member Remy and members of the Columbus City Council. My name is Dr. Curtis Walker Jr. and I'm here today as a resident of a township in Columbus and a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I will advocate for the additions to the current Sustainable Columbus Climate Action Plan and encourage a more aggressive posture in the city's commitment to action that aligns with those proposed by the Ready for 100 Ohio Citizen Forum on Climate Policy. We commend the City of Columbus for proposing the Sustainable Columbus Climate Action Plan. The Office of the Mayor and Office of Sustainability demonstrate leadership in devoting resources to conduct research on current conditions and illustrate potential environmental and economic outcomes as results of commitment to action. We are asking the city to expand its commitment to transformational community engagement use trained facilitators of community dialogue who are experts of the Climate Action Plan and advocates for co-creating solutions. The City of Columbus should have and publish a standard of inclusion and participation at the community level that translates to statements, climate commitments, milestones, and policies that are co-written by community members. We ask the city to consider implementing performance benchmarks and equity assessment in a method to monitor and present ongoing performance to the community to demonstrate progress, discuss challenges, and co-create solutions. The Deep South Center for Environmental Justice provides a model for community engagement and advocacy, strategically employing leading historically Black colleges and universities, such as Dillard University and Texas Southern University, as partners in engaging residents from communities that the student body represents. The city of Columbus should make concerted efforts to engage local HBCUs, two of which are in Ohio, Wilberforce University and Central State University. HBCUs are uniquely positioned to increase knowledge and encourage behavior change in under-resourced communities. HBCUs can identify, partner with, and develop tailored solutions for urban and rural communities that historically have been left behind. We are asking the city to expand its commitment to training existing residents for employment, neighborhood renewal, and sustainable food production and distribution. Workforce development and green collar jobs will be a catalyst for economic development. Employ the skills and ingenuity of community residents and leverage the sense of pride and heritage created over generations within local historical communities. Lastly, environmental contaminants impact the quality of life of all Columbus residents. Consistent results demonstrate outcomes are even worse for Black residents. The science is clear. Columbus residents of historically Black neighborhoods have and continue to suffer exposure to worse air quality and higher heat indices due to the proximity to hazardous pollutants and low density of trees that are contributing factors to worse health outcomes, such as asthma and infant mortality. We ask that the city commit to ensuring that the execution of the Climate Action Plan does not exacerbate health outcomes for Black residents. Partnerships with local health systems and university programs focused on racial and environmental justice can monitor health outcomes. We thank you for your time for this opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. We appreciate you coming down and sharing your testimony this evening. Our next speaker is Victoria Abu Gallium. I hope I didn't mess it up too much, uh, too bad. Um, you have three minutes and please state your name and any uh, group you may be associated with. Hello, Council Member Remy and members of the Environment Committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify this evening. My name is Victoria Abugalium. Um, I'm a PhD student at OSU, Clintonville resident and a member of Sunrise Columbus, which is a youth-led climate justice uh, organization. As a climate activist, I'm thankful that the city of Columbus aims to directly address the climate crisis with the Columbus Climate Action Plan. However, I believe that the current plan must propose more ambitious goals to address the creation and maintenance of sustainable communities that are prepared to handle the impending increased severity of climate change in our region. 
The current CAP goals to support sustainable neighborhoods includes mapping existing resilience hubs, identifying gaps in green space, and completing vulnerability assessments by 2030. That's 10 years to assess who and where in our city is going to be affected by climate change and a missed opportunity to begin preparing those communities for the short and long-term effects of the changing climate in central Ohio. We need to begin protect protecting our most vulnerable communities today. We know what happens when communities are left without support to recover from disaster. We see it again and again as events like Hurricane Katrina increase in frequency and severity as the climate crisis progresses. We also know that these communities tend to be Black, Indigenous, and people of color or BIPOC communities as historic legacies of res residential segregation have worked to move BIPOC to physically vulnerable areas. A better and more ambitious goal would be to map out these resiliency hubs, gaps in green space, and conduct the vulnerability assessments by 2022. Then the next eight years can be used to begin implementing the CAP's current long-term goals in this area. Specifically, by 2030, we should be able to have resilience hubs within a 15-minute walk for all residents, green space within a 10-minute walk, and protections for physically vulnerable areas of our city in place. We urge you to connect some of these goals with existing goals for the city when possible, such as the Urban Forestry Master Plan, in order to bring green space to every neighborhood, and double down on our efforts for climate change adaptation and mitigation. As the short-term goals are completed, we hope the city can use that opportunity to engage with residents to achieve a continuous cycle of feedback of improvements on the cap. Um, when I think of a city I want to live in, it's a connected and vibrant community. Think of being able to build relationships with my neighbors who are not only able to support their livelihoods, but are also free from threats of natural disaster and environmental harm. As a member of the BIPOC community, I know that we need ambitious plans now to protect us from current and future harms as many other people have testified on today, such as urban heat island effects, um, which are exacerbated by lack of green space and critical, critical infrastructure in our public schools. So thank you again for allowing me to speak. I hope that members of the council and our entire community can advocate for strong climate action that meets the science by pursuing more ambitious goals. These are the foundations of building sustainable neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming down and testifying this evening. We truly appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is Eve Warnock. Ms. Warnock, welcome to back to council. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So my name is Eve Warnock and I am a mother. I am an owner of a business. I am a volunteer for the Ready for 100 team, and I'm also a strategist for community outreach uh, for a company called Warhol Wall Street. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for holding this meeting, uh, Council Member Remy and the sustainable team. I have been working on environmental issues for the last two and a half to three years, and as an artist, been speaking about it for about 15 years. And uh, one thing I'm hearing a lot in this meeting is the act of collaboration. So something I do a lot is find connections and networks. And uh, one thing I, I really think about is uh, how the city works with private and public organizations to create the change that we, um, that we need. And I would uh, echo uh, Victoria Abgalia um, about the idea that the time is now. I do not think that the climate action plan right now at 2030 is hitting the goals that we need to be at. Point, poignantly, I'd like to talk a little bit about the development area and the commercial buildings. Uh, when I drive through Columbus, I see a ton of cranes and I see crazy development happening. And I wondered to myself, who is speaking to these developers about sustainable goals? Um, are they thinking renewable energy? And I just wonder if the city has contacted or put together a team. Now, I know they're working with Smart Columbus, but is this happening now? And is this being put into place? I also look at some of the corridor projects that are happening um, as the streets are being rebuilt and revitalized. Are we thinking in these terms too? Are we using our collaborative efforts with um, all these organiz organizations that are here on this, on this phone call to create um, new ideas about how do we add renewable energy to our corridors? What is that going to look like and how can it um, impact the, the neighborhood and the communities. And then I think about the resiliency hubs too. And these hubs that are, could be neighborhoods. These neighborhoods could be resiliency hubs working with the Columbus Division of Power. You know, I echo the idea of, of community solar and these microgrids that exist within this larger grid. Um, are we thinking about that as we're doing these projects? So I, I would say the time is now and we start thinking about that and assessing all of this way sooner and starting to act 
thank you very much for letting me speak today. And I am super excited about the changes that have been happening and the Climate Action Plan. We're getting there. So let's just keep moving it. Thank you so much, Ms. Warnock. We appreciate your testimony this evening. Our next speaker is Rachel Wagner. Welcome back, Rachel. Uh, Council Member Remy and members of Sustainable Columbus. My name is Rachel Wagner and I volunteer with Ready for 100, the Columbus chapter of the Sierra Club Clean Energy Campaign. I'm here to testify for the Climate Action Plan. I'm so glad that Columbus is engaging in this process. I'm also here to ask that some key goals in the plan be increased and specifically this evening, I'll vouch for goal 8.1. Uh, right now that goal is a 10% commercial energy use reduction by 2030 and a 20% municipal energy use reduction as well. I would ask for a slightly higher goal for 2030, 25% energy use reduction in commercial, municipal and residential. Uh, there are several reasons why I'm getting behind this specific goal of increasing energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, number one, modifying buildings so that less energy is needed is a highly effective strategy to reduce emissions. Um, and as you know, emissions are the reason for climate change and thus the crux of what we will need to change in order to preserve a habitable planet. Uh, number two, prioritizing energy efficiency upgrades in Columbus through policies and incentives will create more demand for an industry that is already growing. Um, because of the pandemic, there is an even greater need for policies that support regional job growth. Um, perhaps the city of Columbus can partner with local organizations to create job training opportunities in energy efficiency. Uh, and for example, Carboro, North Carolina established an energy efficiency loan fund for small businesses. Um, and in Charlottesville, Virginia, the incentive is a reduced tax rate of 50% on the building value for one year if energy efficiency standards are met. Uh, my final point here is that we can choose to focus on equity as we raise this goal. 13% of Americans pay more than 10% of their income on their energy bills and these people have disproportionately been Black, Hispanic, Native American, lower income, and older adults. If we prioritize weather, weatherizing residential buildings where financial assistance is most needed, we can achieve more equitable energy outcomes. Um, I gave testimony for the energy benchmarking initiatives for large commercial buildings last year. Uh, and I've been in meetings recently about the community programming that will be created because of the aggregation contract for 100% renewable energy that Columbus is now in. Uh, so I know that the city is already considering addressing the energy efficiency upgrades that many homeowners need financial assistance for. So I believe that we can do this. It makes sense to aim higher for 2030 and to raise goal 8.1 in the Climate Action Plan. Uh, finally, I just want to close by saying that I'm taking time this week to fill out the survey about the draft climate action plan that I was alerted about through the City Council newsletter. Uh, thank you for your work, leaders, and thank you for having me speak tonight. Thank you, Ms. Wagner, for your testimony, and thank you for filling out that survey. Hopefully, uh, more people will do that as well. Our next speaker is Jeremiah Taylor. Mr. Taylor, welcome to Council. You have three minutes. Please state your name and any group you may be attending. Hi, I hope you guys can hear me all right. Um, uh, Columbus City Council, thank you for allowing me to testify this evening. My name is Jeremiah Taylor. I'm a real estate agent uh, with the Clark Group at LifePoint and Westerville, and I'm a member of Sunrise Columbus, a youth-led climate justice movement. I commend the City of Columbus for directly addressing the climate crisis with the Columbus Climate Action Plan. I appreciate everyone and the development of this plan for simply acknowledging climate change as there are too many people in positions of power that straight up deny this crisis. Um, and I especially like that according to the plan, by 2050, there will be a micro-ability hub within a half mile of all residents. However, I believe that the current cap must propose more ambitious goals to address this issue by implementing this even sooner as people's livelihoods depend on it. The CAP currently proposes to address the issue of bus congestion, emissions, and access to transportation other than a personal vehicle by working with large organizations and institutions to utilize bus services as a regular commuting option to work or school. 
The cap proposes to make walking safer and have more micro-mobility options, such as electric scooters and bicycles. The cap is planning to achieve a 20% increase in walk and bike score by 2030. It also states that the micro-mobility hub will be within a half mile from all residents. A better goal would be to successfully implement um, micro-mobility hub 50% quicker. Instead of 2050, why not 2035? Columbus is currently a car dependent city with the average household having two cars and a majority, 81% of commuters traveling alone to work. The largest proportion of transportation emissions comes from the single occupant vehicle miles. More bikes, scooters, safer streets, buses, and better routes on those buses is a better Columbus and a better planet. I moved from LA at 18 after finishing high school and I returned to Ohio and I called Powell my home for a little less than six months. I would have loved to stay longer, but it was impossible to start my life up again. I had debt to repay, medical bills, a phone bill, and other bills that required me to get a job. If you look up where I lived in Powell on Coda.com, there are zero bus routes within a two-mile radius. I couldn't walk to a gas station, grocery store, anywhere to be able to find work. That required me to move, to, to move my life again to my sister's, where we shared a one-bedroom apartment. There are 54 bus routes within a two-mile radius of her apartment which then allowed me to go to interviews, which led to employment, go to doctors, dentist appointments, hang out with friends, and just essentially have a life. I was lucky enough to be able to have a sister where though I wasn't living like a king, I had a roof over my head. I was able to get my feet on the ground again. What about people that don't have anywhere else to go? What should they do? Yes, it's possible I could have walked four miles to the closest target where I temporarily had a job, but had to quit because I couldn't get there reliably. But why make it harder than it already is when it doesn't have to be? Thank you again for hearing my, my testimony. I hope what you've heard today from my peers and I is that you implement into your new revised plan. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. We appreciate you coming down this evening. Our next speaker is Nolan Rush. Let me get this right, Rush Schilling. Um, hopefully I said that close enough. You can correct me. Uh, welcome to council and we look forward to your testimony. Thanks, you got it perfectly, uh, council member Remy. Uh, my name is Nolan Rutschling, and I'm here as a resident of Columbus. I want to thank all of council for the opportunity to speak today on this crucial plan. I'd also like to thank Elena Shockey, Jenna Topaldi, and Aaron Beck for leading uh, the work on this crucial effort. Tonight, I'd like to make two specific recommendations focused on supporting the city's working families. First, the city needs to continue to protect its residents from losing access to water natural gas, and electricity. This plan is a great opportunity to commit to that. Climate change will make our weather more extreme, resulting in more outages and utility unpredictability like what we just saw in Texas last month. The city should have a comprehensive strategy in place to protect its residents from both rising utility costs and predatory door-to-door -door utility salespeople who often trick folks into signing on to risk-laden contracts. In Texas, we saw folks who were persuaded to join wholesale uh, or variable rate plans that led to over a 7,000% increase in their utility bills. This sort of scenario will become more common as climate change continues to make our weather more extreme and the city needs to prepare now to protect its residents. Secondly, the draft plan calls for the city to advocate, to quote, advocate for state policies that align with low carbon and resilient solutions, end quote. I recommend that the plan's advoc advocacy be extended to include work at the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio or the PUCO. Other municipalities, nonprofits, businesses, and interest groups regularly intervene in cases at the PUCO, advocating for lower rates, more resilient infrastructure, and tangible benefits for their residents or members. For example, the city of Dayton recently participated at the PUCO intervening in Dayton Power and Light's proposed grid modernization plan. In doing so, they were able to ultimately secure resilient infrastructure for Dayton's opportunity neighborhoods, start a revolving loan fund that will fund energy upgrades for small and micro businesses, and secure $200,000 annually in ec economic development funding geared towards low-income residents. Cincinnati was also recently able to secure a number of benefits at the PUCO and a stipulation with their local utility, Duke. Cincinnati secured support for 25 megawatts of solar to be built on city property and a commitment from the utility on a battery and microgrid pilot program. 
PUCO advocacy is an efficient, cost-effective way for the city to advocate for lower-income folks, support climate action at the regional level, and secure real financial benefits for its residents. Thank you, uh, and I'm excited to see where this plan goes. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you, Mr. Rush Schilling. We appreciate you coming down and speaking this evening with your uh, testimony. Our next speaker is Matt Crawford. Welcome, Matt. Hello, Council Member Remy and other members of Columbus City Council. Uh, thanks for allowing me to testify this evening. Um, my name is Matt Crawford. I'm retired from Ohio State where I taught environmental and occupational health. Um, I have been a resident of Columbus for almost 38 years. Uh, I also serve on the board of uh, Simply Living. I commend the city of Columbus for directly addressing the climate crisis with the Columbus Climate Action Plan. This is the first attempt at a comprehensive approach limiting our carbon emissions. Um, I, however, I do believe the, the current Climate Action Plan must propose more ambitious goals to address rooftop solar installation. Uh, Kathy Cowan Becker uh, touched on this in her remarks, but uh, I'll reiterate, the draft plan calls for 10 megawatts of solar to be installed in Columbus homes by 2030. Uh, in Los Angeles, installed 250 megawatts in five years. Uh, obviously, they're a much bigger city, uh, probably have some more resources they, they could devote to this, but uh, if we raise our goal for residential solar to about 200 megawatts by 2030, uh, that would put solar on about 40,000 more homes in Columbus. That's could save 220,000 tons of carbon emissions or about 2% of the 2018 baseline. Um, so, and the approach to increasing rooftop solar has to ensure that people of modest means, uh, folks who are under-resourced uh, or are traditionally uh, underrepresented, uh, that those folks are assisted in getting solar installations on their homes or apartments. And that could include assisting landlords <clears throat> to get their, their uh, buildings fitted with, with solar. Uh, I'm addressing you this evening not because of my own vulnerability to the effects of the climate crisis, but rather to avoid, uh, to, rather to advocate for a plan that makes it more likely that our seven and five year old great nieces here in Columbus will have a livable environment in their adulthoods. Uh, the five year old was born with a congenital heart problem and cleaner air now makes life better for her at all stages of her life. Any immediate gains we can make in renewable power will improve the health of all people. I want to thank the council members for the opportunity to address the need for immediate strong climate action. I'm thankful to be able to advocate for climate action with the hopes that council will pursue more ambitious goals in achieving carbon neutrality for the city of Columbus. Uh, thank you so much for the work you're doing. We, we have to do this. Roll up our sleeves, get it done. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Crawford. We certainly appreciate it. Our next speaker is Bailey Fulweiler. Welcome. Hello. How are you all doing today? You can't really respond, so I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> You're good. You're good. I'm, ba <laughs> I'm Bailey Fulweiler. I'm a social worker here in Columbus, Ohio, serving the South Side. Um, and I'm also a member of the Ohio Environmental Council's Emerging Leader Council. Um, and I'm so thankful for all of you for being here tonight. Um, and I'm really excited to see the work that the city's doing um, in this initial drafting phase. But I am concerned that this plan wasn't really designed by or for the people of our city. My clients are the most impacted by climate change in our city and those that will be most at risk if we're not bold and thoughtful in our actions. While we've had lots of other brilliant speak if people speak um, about how we're not meeting the targets set by climate experts, what I really want to speak about is the lack of resident ownership in this plan and the lack of tangibility in the plan's goals to empower the community as climate leaders. The items that were in the plan, such as providing steps to reduce our own carbon footprint, um, things like having engagement events and things like having a website, really don't work for my clients and my community. There are people who might struggle to have tech access, they might struggle with the internet. Um, if we're talking about youth, if we're talking about seniors, if we're talking about homeless people, those are all populations that the current engagement strategies we have really weren't designed for. If we're gonna work on something that's for everybody, we need to be in our schools, we need to be in assistant living homes, we need to be out in the streets, and we need to be 
um, finding safe ways in COVID to engage people in person for those who aren't going to be able to engage with us online or might not be connected with impact or the leaders that you have right now. If we're talking about climate empowerment, that comes from resident-led initiatives that are funded and supported by the city. Unless our residents have their voice, their ownership, and their vision for climate justice recognized, our plan will be incomplete and ultimately unsuccessful. Our world really doesn't need more climate experts. It needs messy advocates engaging in solutions that make sense for their neighborhood, their community, and their dreams. I really wanna see my friends, my neighbors, and my clients not just represented, but actively involved in this plan. Well, there are so many fun ways that we can do this. We can have youth engagement where we have partnerships with the Department of Parks and Rec, with the Columbus Zoo, with COSI, with the Franklin Park Conservatory. We have all these spaces where people feel safe and already connect, where we can engage and support youth climate leaders and families to launch their own climate projects. We can make sure that the parks that we're designing are designed with residents, not just providing residents an opportunity to comment after the plans are made so that the parks feel safe and relevant to community members and they'll be used and maintained. If we're gonna be planting trees, we need the community to be involved as citizen scientists and be planting and monitoring those urban forests, just like we're seeing all over the globe, um, especially in Freetown, Sierra Leone. They have a great example of how their mayor is making sure that their residents are the leaders when it comes to their tree initiative. We need partnerships with our schools and our universities and our art museums to fund and have resources for artists to use their skills and their powers to address climate change. We also need partnerships with juvenile corrections, our jails, our prisons, our reentry specialists, and again, our schools to provide pathways for those hurt by our criminal justice system to learn the skills for a living wage job in the green industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Fulweiler. I appreciate your testimony this evening. Uh, our next speaker is Allie Chitwood. I don't see her. Do you I, see her? I think Allie, um, is no longer in attendance with us. Thank you very much. Then we go next to Darlene Slater. Welcome, Darlene. Appreciate your testimony this evening. Yes, yeah, th yeah, thank you. Good evening. Council Member Remy and other members of the committee, thank you so much for allowing me to speak this evening. I am Darlene Slater and I'm representing the Little Turtle community as a Columbus resident for 34 years and as president of a civic association. I'm honored to be here as a part of this discussion on behalf of the Ohio Sierra Club. And like that organization, I do ask city council and this committee to take a more aggressive approach to preserving all green space and increasing the tree canopy in our great city. I totally support the Columbus Climate Action Plan and greatly increasing the tree canopy for all neighborhoods and in the near future. Rather than preserving trees and green space in my neighborhood, however, just the opposite is going to happen if the Little Turtle Way roadway project starts this spring by the city of Columbus. The city's roadway plan will remove 18 mature trees, not counting the smaller trees, and remove the beautiful natural meadowland grasses that currently exist on our 50-year-old boulevard entrance. Little Turtle is, or was, a hidden gem, and most of the residents, like myself, have lived there for decades. We all chose to live there because of its park-like look and feel. The entrance green space is very welcoming when one returns home. One instantly has a sigh of relief when you arrive at the entrance and you think to yourself, I'm home. I was born and raised in Southern Ohio and my father was a farmer. I love Southern Ohio's rolling hills. Little Turtle so reminds me of my childhood. My father taught me to respect the earth and the value of each and every tree. In the course of his life, my father planted thousands of trees on his farm. And by the way, my father's still living at age 99. It still pains him whenever one of these trees has to come down to, dis to disease or other reasons. And I've inherited that preservation trait from my father. In respecting the Little Turtle community, the residents are totally against the proposed roadway plan because of the destruction of the beautiful green space. 
All our residents at Little Turtle want to preserve our iconic boulevard entrance as it was originally intended by the owner in the way it's been for 50 years. It will be so painful to watch when the city starts bulldozing our boulevard and its trees, which will forever change the landscape of our general rolling hills neighborhood. City has stated that it will try to preserve one tree, the old oak tree that the residents call the Civil War tree. Uh, but we've had tree experts advise the removal of the northbound lanes will essentially destroy the root system and lead to the tree's demise. What a huge loss that's going to be to lose this 200 plus year old tree. We ask you to renew the city's efforts to increase the tree canopy and to preserve green space and to please start right here in Little Turtle in Columbus. Not every square inch of land needs to be developed, right? I re recently watched a TV show on WOSU about the national parks, and someone stated that it's the American way to preserve green space. Green space makes one happier, and science has shown that it leads to longer lives. There's a correlation between increases in green space and increases in happiness, decreases in depression, and a general bump to well-being and life satisfaction. And we all want that. So thank you to all city council and committee members for listening. I hope I'm able to make the point of how important it is for Columbus to continue a strong stand on its climate action plan. Columbus, Little Turtle is my home now and I want to do everything that I can to preserve it. We ask you to start with the Little Turtle community now by preserving its trees and its green space, please. Time is of the essence and we do thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slater. Appreciate your testimony this evening and certainly appreciate your leadership running your civic association. Our final speaker this evening is Connor Willis. Connor, welcome to council. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, great. Well, thanks council member Remy uh, for hosting this meeting and thanks for the city staff uh, for their work on this plan. I, my main sort of comment or feedback for this plan is I do think that we really need to be focused on that 45% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030 because that's what the science requires of, of us at this moment. And that is uh, what many of our peer cities are striving for. I think you heard earlier in the testimony, the city of Cleveland, the city of Cincinnati, Cuyahoga County, all have more ambitious greenhouse gas reduction emissions. Uh, if you think about the aggregation, if I understand this correctly, uh, and I may, I may have something incorrect here, but Kathy mentioned that aggregation is going to lead to a 12% reduction approximately in greenhouse gas emissions, which means we're already halfway to our 2030 goal by the vote at the ballot box in November. That means we have a, a lot more room for ambition uh, to, to really hit that 2030 goal that we have to hit. And I think the way we do that is we get more detailed on the 30 actions and uh, policy statements that are outlined in this plan. As I've gone through many of them, I, um, I have questions about where we got the numbers and uh, why, how they benchmark to other communities. So for example, the city has a 10,000 uh, green job goal by 2030. Uh, how does that compare to other peer cities? Are those jobs for Columbus residents? Are they for the state of Ohio? Are they full-time? Are they part-time? What, What's the detail on our goal there? Uh, I, I would love to see a little bit more uh, of that fleshed out. Uh, many folks have mentioned that the 10 megawatts of residential solar goal, that's roughly doing solar on 200 single family homes every year for the next 10 years. We can, we can scale that up uh, uh, tremendously, particularly with the cost of solar coming down uh, like they have so rapidly. Uh, just a final quick example, and there's many that have been mentioned throughout the night, but there's a, a plan in here, an action to uh, pilot microgrid and storage projects with the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, I, I applaud that. I think that's the right direction. Um, I'm just wondering where we got that number and uh, why can we do more? And if we are going to reimagine what our Department of Public Utilities looks like over the next 10 years, we ought to think about other items such as community solar. We have 12,000 uh, customers of the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, all of them can be served with solar with the right policies in place. So I do think that we, with the level of detail uh, and benchmarking in this policy framework that's here, if we expand that, uh, we can really get to that 45% uh, 
greenhouse gas goal, uh, because that's kind of what we have to do. Uh, and that's what the science tells us. So I look forward to seeing some more detail uh, in the next couple of months. And, and thanks for everyone's hard work on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Willis. We appreciate you coming in tonight and testifying. And so there we have it. Thank you everyone that uh, provided written testimony and also the speakers that came in tonight to speak during this public hearing. Before we bring this hearing to a close, I want to thank the community for their engagement and feedback on the Climate Action Plan. This plan is still in draft mode, as we said, and public comment on the plan will be open through March 31st, 2021. The plan can be viewed at columbus.gov slash sustainable slash CAP, C-A-P for Climate Action Plan. I want to thank our presenters, Aaron Beck, Elena Shockey, and Jenna Tipoldi, and the entire Sustainable Columbus team for your hard work to prepare this much needed climate action plan for the city of Columbus. I would also like to thank Angela Burks, Mark Carter, and our CTV team for assisting with our technology needs and connecting us with the community. I want to acknowledge and show my appreciation to my council colleagues for joining us in this discussion, Council Member Dorans and Council Member Favor, and all of my colleagues that were listening in tonight. Lastly, I'd like to thank my team, Jeffrey Carter and Lucy Frank, for your efforts in preparing us for this hearing. Have a great evening, everyone.